and say, my, you look beautiful. Now look at the person on the other side and say, I'm glad I don't look like you. be a good day. I think people are making their way in. We have our normal starting time that we advertise, and then we have the actual gathering place starting time. It's two different things. Okay, we do have a lot going on here, and uh, if you want to be involved in what the church has to offer, then you might want to pay attention to these announcements. This is GP120, your church news in about two minutes. Good morning and welcome to the gathering place. If you're a guest this morning, we are so glad you're here. We hope you enjoy the service and join us again soon. The Marriage on the Rock class continues this week. God has a perfect plan for your marriage. And your marriage doesn't need to be crumbling and falling apart to benefit from this class. No, it doesn't. The group meets on Saturdays at 6 p.m. starting this Saturday. See Kyle Butterball, that's the gorgeous bald-headed guy that's fixing the sand immediately after. And child care is provided, so make it a date night. Hey church, we want to remind you that we have Sunday morning Bible study. And it's Awesome. Awesome. Yes. Class starts at 9.30 back in the library and is directed by Matt and Nikki Hangler. So get here early and get into the work. Word. Yeah. Oh my hey, GP family, we are going to work the concession stand again this year at the Washington High School homecoming game on September 8th. We need at least 15 people to help support our local students. We always have a lot of fun. A lot of fun. So sign, ooh, yeah. so sign up today in the lobby or see Andrea Butterball. Lots of food. Yes. Did you know that our church has a visitation ministry? If you or your family members are hospitalized, ill, or just need someone to stop by, call the church office and let us know. A member of our visitation team will be giving your information and they will contact you soon. Did you hear Pastor John's message about staying in touch with family? Yes, it was great. And if you haven't yet signed up for the GP text group, do it today. You will receive event reminders and special announcements sent right to your phone. And an occasional message from Pastor John. So get your phone out right now and text GP to 59769 and stay connected with your GP family. Quick reminders, Amp Teens meet tonight at 6 p.m. Bible study Wednesday at 7. Check out Sunday morning Bible study next week at 9.30. That's it for GP120. Have a great week. Good morning. Slow arrival times. Let's pray. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spend any time talking about anything silly this morning. Although I can. We're we're in for a treat. The kids are gonna lead us in praise and worship, which is always good. Uh, communion. And then whatever God wants. How's that? We'll go from there. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day. Lord, in all of our distractions, teach us to focus 
upon you. Lord, give us uh, the realization of the things to come. And Lord, I just ask that uh, if people come in here today and their hearts are heavy and they're thinking about other things, that they realize they're in the right place, in your presence. 24-7, you allow us to be in your presence. Father, take us to the point we know we can take advantage of that. Lord, I just ask today, too, that you guide and direct us. And you thank us. Thank you for this wonderful things you do in our lives. Lord, I sat there this week in my sinuses. It's going to kill them. But I thank you that I can cough and I can blow my nose. Those are simple things we fail to realize. You've created us magnificently in everything you've done. I thank you for that. Satan, we rebuke you today. You have no place. Father, teach us to be warriors. Teach us to pray. Father, you changed my way of praying. I am rebuking the enemy in all forms. ISIS, demonic powers, heroin, what's hovering over Fayette County. I'm rebuking it, Father. We're going to send it back to the, the pits of hell. It doesn't belong here. Why do we allow it to be here? Let the church arise and take back what you give us. And whether the world knows it or not, it's the whole world. So church, I just ask that we learn to pick up our feet and take back what's ours. All of it. All of it's ours. So today, Lord, we just give this service to you. We thank you for what you've done for us. And thank you for the blessings. And thank you for our pastor, Father. I appreciate him. I appreciate our praise and worship team. I appreciate everyone in this church. We thank you in Jesus' name.
I love you. You are wonderful. Hey, man, how you doing? Hello. They're still coming. Thank you, Lord, for all these boys and girls. We bless them in Jesus' name. We surround them, believing, Lord, that you're going to put warring angels and ministering spirits over them because your word says that their angels are always in your face. So we believe that, and they're very special. And I'm going to pray for an anointing on the teachers. That's right. That the word that they have to say will penetrate their hearts. And that they will receive and understand the wonderful mysteries of the kingdom of God. And as I've said so many times before, maybe they can not have to put up with some of the garbage that we put up with because we didn't know where we were going. So thank you for their parents that brought them. Pray that their homes are blessed. I pray that as many of them have started school again this year, that they're blessed at school and with their peers and they have great relationships. In Jesus' name, amen.
so all I see is you. Strip everything away till all I have is you. Undo the veil. So all I see is you I will pursue you I will pursue your presence I will pursue you I will pursue you
Lord, your name is great and worthy to be praised. And Jesus, when he taught us how to pray, first thing he said is, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Then, Father, you gave the name above all names in the spirit world to your son, Jesus. And at the name of Jesus, demons tremble and flee. Every problem and everything we have to deal with at the name of Jesus, we have spiritual authority. And I thank you for that. Because that name and that reality is what has made provision for us to live a victorious, overcoming life in this fallen world and absolutely have the power and the dominion that you intended us to have. So I thank you, Lord. We're here this morning. We're worshiping, and it's a wonderful experience. I thank you for everybody that's here. I bless them, and I love them. I thank you for all of our other brothers and sisters that are in the other churches here around this town this morning and around the world. And then for those people that are suffering in Texas with that storm, Lord Jesus, I pray you'll intervene and you'll help them and you'll protect them. And this thing can be over quickly. You are the answer, Father, for everything we deal with. So, Lord, open us up to your truth. Help us to see what we need to see to be the overcomers that you intended us to be and that you've made provision for. Thank you for the praise team that led us so wonderfully into praise here this morning. And we, we know we're in your presence. We know that you are here in a mighty way and that each of us are going to receive from you. And this is going to be something that's going to last through this week and it's going to give us strength. We're going to be able to let our light shine in dark places when it's a tough thing to do. People see your light and your life through us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Turn the person beside you and tell them how pretty they are. How beautiful they are. You are beautiful. You are beautiful, Bobby. <laughs> Standing off the side, twiddling my thumbs. I have no idea what I was doing. Uh, we'll pray here in just a minute. Anybody ever had anything happen to you that you realize how God's taken care of you over your life? Does that make any sense what I just said? Uh, I'm a firm believer. I'm speaking for myself here. Every bad thing I've ever done, every most of the time, the bad things that happened to me, I caused. There was a way out. So what I'm saying is I chose to sin. That's a realization come to me this week. We have the ability to sin never again. Think about it. Jesus said we could do far greater things. So whenever we choose to do something wrong, guess who's the fault? The devil didn't make you do anything. can't. He's a little imp. Can't really do I blow him out every day when I blow my nose. A little ball of snot. I'm not worried about it. But that's something to think about. And then I had another thing happen this week. Somebody showed me a picture. And in that picture, there was an individual that I had dated 40-some years ago.
and after I took a good look at her, I'm like, man, God is good. Man, I'm so happy. Went into a bowling alley one night and fell in love with a gal. I mean, thank you, because she's been a wonderful wife. And I said to myself, man, it could have been a miserable. Woo. But let's pray for the people up there that need prayer, along with me. We'll put my name on it because I need something, something to happen. Father, we just thank you. Lord, I know there's different people up there in different situations going on. I know, Lord, Tom and Denise Rizbeck, I know them personally, so I know they're going through trials and tribulations that I can only hardly imagine. But I know, Lord, your hand is upon them. And you're taking care of them. So, Father, where the comfort is needed, comfort, where healing is needed, Lord, I ask that you heal in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you, Father, that that list gets shorter. The day's going to come when there'll be no lists like that. We'll all be whole and, and be in perfect health. Lord, we thank you for it. Father, for our offering, we thank you for it. Thank you for the ability to give. And thank you for the wealth that we have in this country in all ways. Father, we have it in all ways. We don't even, I don't know if there's a poor person in this country. If there are, they're choosing to be. And Lord, forgive us for our poverty mentalities. We need to understand what we really need in life. It's you first. We need to thank you every day for our wonderful families that you've given us. Thank you for our brothers and sisters in the Lord. And like Pastor said, I lift up this community and the churches that are meeting in your name today, Lord. Let them be strong and powerful and let us realize we are the church. The building is something else, but we are the church as an individual and all together. So we thank you, Father, for the message that's going to come forth. We thank you for this day in Jesus' name. It is really good to see you here this morning. Lord, I want to leave here with something that I did not come in with. I want to grasp hold of something that's going to make my life different. And I believe, Lord, that that's what you have for us. It will open up. You can sow that reality deep in us that we can hear what you have to say. And when you speak, things happen. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Paul thought he was doing the right thing and he was persecuting Christians. He was rounding them up because they were following this guy that was claiming to be the son of God. And they said, hey, this, this is not the Messiah we're waiting on. The Messiah we're waiting on is going to come and he's going to take over the world and we're going to rule the world. We're going to be in charge of everything. This guy's come along and all he's talking about is loving each other. 
and not judging one another. So Paul, a Pharisee of all Pharisees, he's tracking them down, hauling them in, putting them in chains. But he got knocked down. He saw a bright light so bright that he went blind for a couple, three days, and then he started to believe in Jesus. Now the tables are turned and he's laying in prison. He's chained. The prisons they had back then weren't like ours today. They were a slab probably of rock and then they had open gutters going through them for all the sewage and they were chained and they weren't in a very pleasant place. And in Philippians, Paul decides he's going to write to this church from prison because he knew that they were experiencing persecution and dark days. And in Philippians 4, 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord. Laying on a rock, chained, open sewers running through where he was. Probably damp. I imagine there were rats and every other thing. Rejoice in the Lord. And the Philippians facing persecution and maybe even death, and he's saying, Rejoice in the Lord. Wow. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, Rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. He's encouraging them. Christian joy is totally independent of your situations and your circumstances. Paul proved it. The early church lived it. You may be going through something that you think is the hardest thing you've ever gone through. You may be experiencing things that are very unpleasant, but the joy that you have in Jesus is independent of what you're going through, period. That's why it's so powerful. It's like you could be knocked down, but not knocked out. Everybody's talking about the big fight last night. Christian joy wins a fight. Doesn't matter how many times you hit the mat. It brings you back. Because we all go through stuff. But this Christian joy is independent of a situation and circumstances because... You can't lose it because you can't lose Jesus. You would have to order him out to lose him. Jesus has paid the price. It's a done deal. He is victorious no matter what you feel or what you do. And when you tap into him, you are too. Victorious in Jesus' name. The word that he used here was gentleness, but if you were to look up the definition of the original word that was used in this text, it means patience. It, it also means moderation. It means thinking with a patient mind. So this word gentleness isn't like softy. It doesn't, doesn't want you to be just a soft individual. Nothing wrong if you want to be soft, you'd be soft. But I really don't want to be soft because i got too many things that hit me that if I'm really soft, it might hurt me, spiritually speaking. But it's saying that we have to be patient. Let your patience, your mind that is thinking in the right place with patience and, and moderation. Let that be known to all men. And that's very, very important because there are so many people. I was talking to a young man yesterday that have the same idea that I had as a young man about what this experience with Jesus is. And as a young man, I thought it was a list of rules and regulations. And somehow I had to measure up to those rules and regulations or 
I could not know Jesus. So I just decided, since I could not measure up to all that stuff, I would just do what I was doing, and I was hellbound. Talking to a young man yesterday, didn't know anything about church, had never been raised in church, and yet that was his perception. Rules and regulations that he could not do. So we have to have this patience. We have to have this moderation. We have to have love and acceptance. And we have to wrap our arms around people. We have to be able to show mercy because mercy's been shown to us. We've given. It says we freely give what we're given. It's really not talking about your billfold. We freely give the mercy that's been extended to us because all of us need God's mercy. We don't measure up. No one here measures up. Jesus is the only righteous one. And because of his blood, he wouldn't have had to have come and died for us if we could measure up. We don't measure up. We accept his blood on our life. And he, he, we see now the relationship with the Father is as the Father looks through Jesus' blood and sees each one of us as righteous, pure, and holy. And that's what we are because we've made the choice to receive Jesus' blood. Jesus left us an example of that when they were stoning the woman in adultery and the law clearly said that if a woman was an adulterous woman that she should be stoned. So Jesus comes up and all the righteous people were getting ready to stone the woman and, and he walks up and he stops that from happening. He showed her mercy. He helped her up. He said, where's your accusers? And they had all dissipated. They said, okay, get up and go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Change your lifestyle. Be what I want you to be. That mercy extended. The mercy that we receive changes us. And we move into a new place with the presence and the power of God. But when we see somebody being stoned again, we don't pick up the stones and start to participate. It's an easy thing to do. It's an easy thing to do to talk about people's downfall, to talk about things that they're not measuring up with, to talk about things that uh, we see them do or they have done. It's an easy thing to do to repeat something somebody said. I don't know what it is about we human beings, but when somebody tells you something and says, now don't tell anybody else, it just really feeds that demon, doesn't it? <laughs> Glenda has to tell me that a few times because I tell everything. I'm just a total open book. A lot of times when she says, now you shouldn't tell anybody that, I've already forgotten it. So that's my strength is I just forget everything people tell me. The Lord is good. Why do we need this joy and graciousness in our life? Why do we need to be patient? We have to have that because the, the light of the Holy Spirit shines through our humility and our patience more than any other thing. I want to be powerful. I want to be able to lay my hands on people and I want to see them receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want to see them healed. I want all that, but you know the way people are going to see Jesus in me is because I'm loving them and because I'm patient and because I'm treating them the way they ought to be treated. And I'm not trying to stone them. That's what this thing's all about. It's all about loving people until they see something in you that they want to see. It's not stern justice and a list of rules. It's something that we live. And it's something that they can see. And it can give them hope when everything else is coming against them. It can be an overcomer. And we can know that as God deals with us, we can show that love and mercy through our life and our actions. 
You know, the golden rule, do unto others. You'd have others do unto you. All this relationship stuff that's in the Word. And as we go on in Philippians 6, 4, 6, he says, how, we are, how are we going to accomplish this? Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all your understanding, will guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. So Paul's saying, rejoice. Show that you're a patient person person, with moderation and you can give people mercy. And now what he's saying here is trust. Because he's wanting us to take everything that we deal with to the Father. That was part of the reason Jesus died. I know that he was our sacrifice. But he also opened up the pipeline to the Father. So now we approach him through prayer. And Paul's wanting them to see this, that, hey, if you're going to be able to rejoice and you're going to be able to have this patience with other people and you're going to be able to extend God's mercy, then you, you have to be able to trust the Lord. We all fall short of our trust. We come up against things that we wrestle through until finally we become so exhausted we say, there's nothing left to do but pray. I have heard that for years. There's nothing left to do but pray. Well, why didn't you pray to start with? before there's nothing left to do. What did all your doing do for this situation? <laughs> Zero. So he's saying, take everything to the Father in prayer. Take everything. Because everything you deal with is a spiritual issue and the Father is a spirit according to the Word of God. And Jesus has the name that's above all names in the spiritual realm. So with thanksgiving, he's saying, come to me with thanksgiving for what is to come. I've told this story before, but I watched my dad. We had an old bus, three million miles on the old bus, I think it was. And the old bus belched a lot of oil. And it would break down just about every time you went someplace. And he was laying under it one day with grease dripping in his face. And this was his testimony. He said the Lord showed him that until he started being thankful for what he already had, God was not going to give him anything better. And so from that day forward, he said he started to fall in love with the old bus said he would go around it and pat it and thank the Lord for it. Say, so just pat it. Lord, thank you for this old girl. He named it. <laughs> old girl. <laughs> he patted it. And then he said it wasn't very long before the Lord supplied a new one. With thanksgiving, it accompanies our prayer. And with that thanksgiving, We can expect things to happen. Be thankful for where you are now because this moment's going to be gone. Be thankful for the present because there's good things happening right now. In your hardest time, there's something good happening every moment of your life. Because Paul, laying in this prison, on this stone floor, chained, and the open sewers running right past him, he was able to say, rejoice. Something good was happening. We are the recipients of his writings while he was in that mess. The church was encouraged at that time because he was in a mess and they could take courage because of what he was going through. And we today can apply this to our life. 
Some 2,000 years later, we're applying what Paul did when he was in a terrible condition. There was something good going on. We need to first pray with thankfulness for the forgiveness of sins. We can thank the Lord for forgiving us. We can thank the Lord that He is forgiving us, has forgiven us, and He will forgive us. We pray for forgiveness. We're thankful. We pray for things we need. He said He's going to meet all of our needs according to His riches and glory. He said that. It's a done deal. If you don't believe it, tear that page out of your Bible and don't read it anymore. And then you can say you've had some revelation that nobody else in the history of, of the Father speaking to man has ever had, so you can rip that out. He will meet your needs according to His riches and glory. What do you need? He'll meet it. Pray and lay it in His lap, and He will do it. You can ask Him for help for guidance in every single decision you make. Lord, I have a decision to make. I'm at the crossroads. I need your guidance. I need your help. Then there are other things that you have a mind that God gave you. And my dad had another expression. I'm talking about dad this morning. He said, use your head for something besides a hat rack, young man. There are some things you just know. When you read in the Bible, the disciples came up to Jesus. They said, oh, Jesus, we need a plan and a program. There's so many people out here, and they need to know about you, and we need to take them the good news of the gospel. See, that's what it was all about. It was good news. Hey, man, I got some good news. How do you want us to go about this, Jesus? He said, just look out there and see that the fields are already hard to uh, we're white to harvest, and you need to pray, Lord, send us some labors to get the job done. There's some things that just the way it is. And I was thinking this morning as I was going over this for the last time, I thought, wow, the gospel is the good news. And I heard Candy say that she had studied one time where it said the, it's, it's the good, almost too good to be true news. And I got to thinking, what, how, what would I do if I had some great news? And how would people receive that great news? I'll bet you I could come to you, man, I have some great news. And you're going to listen, Bob, aren't you? You're going to think, oh, what's this? I want to know this. Great news. Jesus died for your sins, and you have a direct hotline right to the Father. Can you think of anything more powerful? Can you think of anything that will straighten your life out more than that? There is nothing. We actually are connected to the divine. The good news. It's being spread. Meet our needs. And then the all-important thing that we have to pray for, other people. We have to pray for other people. We have to build relationships with people. Why did Jesus always say go? Why does the Great Commission say go? Go, go. I, I, I myself have to work at that. I tell you, I have to work at it. And if you've heard this before, just bear with me. We were traveling for years around the country. When it was all said and done, I think it was 30-some years probably. And after a 10-year period or so, I was with Glenda. We were home. We were eating. We, I think we were at Bob Evans. And she's speaking to everybody that's walking in. Glenda knows everybody. And I'm sitting there, and I didn't know anybody. I'd been gone 10 or 12 years from this community, and I didn't know anybody. And, and the Lord said, you're not doing any good for your community. You're traveling all over the country and telling people about Jesus and singing his songs and lifting my name and encouraging people. And right here in your own hometown, you don't have any influence at all. 
I said, I'm sorry, Lord. And I started praying, Lord, help me to be able to show your love that you gave for me to this community. And through a series of things, a building downtown, uh, starting the Scarecrow Festival and different things, well, I was able to stand on the stage every September to Scarecrow Festival for about 15 years, I think, maybe 10. First five years we weren't even here. And that's, we started arranging our schedule so we could be here. I was able to stand there and tell people how the Lord had rescued me and how sitting in a bar on a hot summer night, the power of conviction came on me. And I knew what it was. Because I've been raised to know what it was. And that's how important it is to get our kids raised in the right place. And let them know because it says we won't depart from it. And we don't. We always know the truth. It doesn't really say that we'll choose the truth, but we'll know the truth. And that moment came. And I was sitting in a bar and I knew what was going on. I turned to the fellow sitting next to me and said, I'm leaving here, never coming back. Walked out on the sidewalk, looked toward heaven, gave my life to Jesus, walked around the corner, and I was delivered. <laughs> Hallelujah. So it worked, didn't it, Randy? Started praying, Lord, let me have some influence in the community. And now, after being out there working on the church for as long as I have, I've had to start praying again. Lord, let me have some influence in the community. And I'm remembering that I've got to be among people. So I told Glenda, rent us two seats at the football game, and I'll be there at every home football game at least to walk around and hug people's necks. And it was amazing. I went even yesterday for the little preview thing. I was there for 30 minutes. BJ was there and a lot of guys and I was just able to see people. What are we doing that are influence and the light of the, Now, if, if you're acting all ugly, you're better off to stay home. <laughs> if you're going to go out and fuss and fight and carry on, just stay home. <laughs> I didn't plan on saying that. But we're thanking God for everything He's done and we can have a true thankful heart in our prayer life and our relationship. We're showing what He wants to see in this trust thing and it's that perfect submission. Because until we submit to God, until we submit to His ways, we're, we really are not showing the trust that he demands that we have. He wants us to trust him. He's got everything put together so good. Submit yourself. Remember and acknowledge what God is. What, what is God to you? What's he look like? Well, according to the Word, He's a God first of love. He's a God of love. He's a, he's a God of wisdom. That's what I said. Every time you're facing something, ask Him. He'll lead us and guide us into all truth. He's a God of love and wisdom. And He's a God of power. In Genesis 1.29, guess what? He decided to create this God of love and wisdom and power started to create. And in Genesis 1.29, he created us. He created man in his likeness and in his image. This God of love and wisdom and power created us in his likeness and in his image. There's only one translation that I can find that it does not say likeness. It only says image. There's only one. But every other translation 
Genesis 127 said we're not only created in His image, but in His likeness. So if God is love and wisdom and power, what are you? What am I? What am I if I wasn't part of this fallen world and living in this house of flesh? If my flesh is weak and my spirit strong, what am I? I'm in God's likeness and in God's power. I'm in His image and in His likeness. I'm in God's love and I'm in His presence. I'm in God and God's in me. We're so intertwined that His Holy Spirit came and just absorbed us. And I'm already created to walk around with that presence in me because I'm created in His likeness and in His image. Think about it. A God of love and wisdom and power created you like Him. Are we gods? Well, we're God in the sense that His Spirit's in us. So if I've allowed His Spirit to come in me, what's my limitation? I'm going to walk out of this world one day. Most of you know I dealt with shingles over two or three weeks. It's about over now, but I can tell you, God helped me to get through it. And I wasn't wanting to sit around and feel sorry for myself because I know that I have God's power in me. The Word says, according to the power that works in you. Well, you're going through something because you're part of this fallen world. But again, what was Paul doing? And I keep reminding myself, Paul's laying there on a slab, chained with open sewers running around him. Rats and whatever. Stink. Bad food. And he's saying, rejoice. To a church that's facing death and persecution. Rejoice. And I say rejoice. He's saying, I've thought of everything I can think of, and there's nothing that you can't rejoice over. Rejoice, and I say again, rejoice. Here we are, God's highest creation, given power and authority over anything the fall can ever bring about or anything that man can ever do to us. He goes on and he gives us a real good idea of how this all comes into being. I think everybody here wants, it, wants this in their life. Don't we all want God's love, wisdom, and power? Don't we all want to be that way? Don't we want to let God's power flow through us? Don't we want to be overcomers? The head, not the tail. All these things we sing about, we talk about, and then when we come up against it, many times we fall short. He goes on in verse 8, chapter 4, and he says, finally, let me finish this thing with you. Finally, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, Get your mind on that. Stinking thinking. It'll get you. It gets me. Stinking thinking. If the devil can just bring somebody along just to plant a little seed, If you allow yourself to see the wrong thing, to hear the wrong thing, you've got control over that. Whichever things he's saying 
or honest, honorable thing. Honorable. Because you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Everywhere you go, everything you see, everything you hear, you're forcing it on the presence of God that's in you. Everything you allow that's not good in your life, you're forcing it on Him because He's in you. You're allowing your flesh to become stronger than His Spirit. Because of the matter of choice, it's hard to believe that we literally can push God's Spirit down to where He takes second place. But that's the reality here. It's like, I think Joyce Myers wrote a book, The Battlefield of the Mind. Your mind is where all this stuff starts to happen. And he's telling us how to think. Because our world is created in our mind. You accomplish things because you know you can. It's the way you think, what you say. He's saying, whatever things are noble, do you know that we're to be a holy nation of kings and priests? You talk about nobility, that's noble. We are a holy nation. And do you know what age we live in right now? According to the Word of God, we live in the church age. What is the church? It's God's people joined together in unity and one accord with the good news being given where it's needed in all of our surroundings. We're His hands. We're His feet. Think on that. It's the church age. We're given the authority as a body of believers to move mountains. As a body of believers, there's nothing beyond God's power. He does own the cattle on a thousand hills. The wealth of this world is His. But He's given us dominion. And if we'll get together and we bind together, there is nothing beyond us. Think it. Think how powerful you are with the body of believers. And how, do, how, will, how will Satan attack you most often? He'll try every time there's a gathering of the church of Jesus Christ, the body. Every time there's a gathering, 20 things come up that could keep you away. 20 things. And I know you're all here this morning, and I'm not, I try not to, talk to the choir, preach to the choir. I'm not doing that. I'm just saying how many things come up when we're gathering together as a church body? How many things come up? How often it seems like just everything comes against you when it's time for the body together. We're in the church age. Satan knows it. And everything that he can have control over will come against you to try to keep you away. Think about things that are just, things that are pure, moral, purity is morality, things that are lovely. That word was meant a very attractive, whimsome spirit. So peace and joy and happiness. And people want to be around you because you're not the complainer. Think about that. When you start to complain next time, think about that. Think about Paul laying on that slab telling you to think about how nice and happy you should be. And he's, he's, he's being happy in a terrible condition. The Holy Spirit reveals himself in us, period. 
If we're in the right condition, our mind is in the right frame. We hear what he's saying. He doesn't speak to us to hear his own voice. He speaks to us to lead us and guide us and empower us. So that we too can love and have wisdom. And we too can have power. And he speaks to us. Are we hearing him? Or, are, or is our mind so cluttered because we've got all this stuff that we shouldn't be entertaining in our head? We've allowed the cares of life and the pressures to come against us to the point that it, we're not thinking about the lovely things. We're not thinking about the good things. We're not thinking about the power that we have through Christ Jesus. We're thinking about all the stuff that we deal with. I sit down to study every day that... that that I'll have something that I can give to you that I think the Lord's given me because it's just my job just to carry you what he gives me. It's not my idea. It's his idea. So I, I try never to let it be my idea. I try always to let it be his idea because as soon as it becomes my idea, it's not going to be any good anymore. So I, I do everything I can to let him show me. And when I sit down to study there many times, Bobby, that everything I'm dealing with comes to my mind. I have never seen so much distraction as when I sit down to dig into the Word of God. And to, well, I have to pray and I have to say, Lord, help me to focus in on what I, every time. Everything will start to happen. Many times a dog will start to bark and one out. Say, Cooper, Glenda gets up and gets him. That's a good thing. But anything, just just things just start to happen, mostly in my head. I'm doing the best I can do. I said, Lord, I've, I've, you've got to help me here. I need to hear your voice. I, this, I'm so distracted. What's going on? It's a spiritual issue. It's a battle of the spirit, not of the flesh. It's a war that's raging because Satan does not want me to get what God's trying to tell me. And it's up to me to get myself in a condition that I can hear what he's saying. God's work is accomplished by God's people. We have a purpose. God created us so this thing would work. And our part is very important. We choose. And we allow ourselves to be used. We control what we can control, and he controls everything else. And as I've had to tell people two or three times already this morning, the one thing you can control is you. You can control what you think. You can control where you go. You can control yourself. You can't control anybody but you. We're getting ready to take communion. And as they get ready, we're going to pass out the elements. Do it like that this morning. And as soon as we get these elements, go ahead, guys, and get ready. We're going to sit there and hold them for a minute. I want your mind engaged in what's about to happen. Communion is not just a ritual. Communion is remembering everything about Jesus. As soon as you get in place, guys, just go ahead and pass it out. Communion is remembering that the Father wanted, wanted a relationship with, with us so badly that he sent Jesus. And Jesus at the Last Supper told us to do this and remember Him. You mean we can forget Jesus? Evidently. He said, do this as often as you do it. Remember me. Get your mind engaged on me. So we're about to take communion. And you've heard it over and over. We know that the wine represents the blood that he shed. And we know that the bread is his body and, 
His body was broken for us, and Sorry, through his body, with a connection. we had such things as provision in all of life's situations and circumstances. Provision that he supplied through his body as he walked this earth. So we've got connection through his blood. We're forgiven. We, we're, we're able to walk in the Spirit because he sent it back. The Bible says the baptism of Jesus is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's what he promised. So the power that's in us that makes us have the ability to be in God's likeness, and in his image comes because Jesus baptizes us with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And he, he comes in us. And so we remember because of his blood, because of his body, because of what he did for us, we now are able to live a life above the fray. Will there still be any problems if I can get a hold of this? Oh, yeah. Jesus said there'll always be temptations, but that's the thing. Even laying on a floor on a rock chained with a sewer running by your head, you're an overcomer. You're above it because you think different and you act different because the presence of the Lord is your source and your strength. So when we take this communion, we remember all that. But as soon as we get these elements, I, I want us to just take a moment and bow our heads. And I want to meditate. I want you to meditate on the presence of the Lord in your life. What are you thankful for? What can you really say, God, I'm thankful for this. What do you need? What, what's the needs in your life? What do you really need? Can you bring that before him? Can you expect him to answer that need? What, what kind of decisions are you trying to make right now? Are there things in your life you're trying to make decisions on? Have you been so busy that you're exhausted? What decisions do you need to make? He's going to guide you. And you're going to believe. How about your relationships? How good are they? Tony, can I have some bread? How good are your relationships? Who do you need to pray for? Who, who you having trouble forgiving? Think about it. Unforgiveness blocks the whole deal. Well, you, you know, they've done me wrong. Well, so what? What if Jesus said that when he came down to the time of being crucified? They haven't treated me right. What if Paul said that? We wouldn't have this truth that we're studying this morning. So, Father, help us. Help us, Lord, to think the right thing. Where is our value? What do we value? Who do we value? 
What's the biggest thing in our life? What's the first thing? What do we give our time to? Jesus, we are remembering you. And I look at your life and the purpose that you had while you were walking around in the flesh of a man. And it was totally the most unselfish act that's ever been done, the most unselfish spirit as you literally gave your life. You took all of our diseases upon you. You took our hurt. You took our pain. Where's my priority? But this morning as I take of this bread and I think of the body that you walked around in, that you gave, for us, Lord, I'm going to be thankful. And I'm going to realize that your life lives on in me. We are your hands and your feet. So for my illnesses, for my diseases, for my salvation, for my power, for my love, for my forgiveness, I take your body. Let's eat the bread. Jesus' body never have to be done again. And your blood, Jesus, that gave us the hotline to heaven. We take this blood and we take it in in the name of Jesus. We are a victorious people, a holy nation of kings and priests. Lord, help us to be strong in the face of temptation. Help us, Lord, to be the light that people can see you as we walk in this existence that we're in. Help us, Lord, to be overcomers. Help us, Lord, to see the reality and the truth of all things in every decision and everything that we do. Give us power to be what you would have us to be, to go out into a lost and dying world, that our light will give them hope in the face of catastrophe. In Jesus' name. Go ahead, Rick. We're going to end with this. And I want you to make this your prayer. Let's all stand together.
Hallelujah!